Okay, so thanks, Saran, for the introduction. And I'm uh, very happy to be here at the, at the Technion and to tell you about some of the exciting research that uh, we have been doing at uh, ETH on uh, the, the topic of machine learning for programming. Okay? So one of the primary reasons for and primary motivation for, for the work that we've been doing in the last three, four years is uh, this increased availability of uh, high quality, freely available programs out there on the web, uh, typically found in repositories such as GitHub, Bitbucket, and others. So here is, for instance, the graph uh, in the number of repositories uh, of, of GitHub in the last uh, three, four years. So uh, around the end of last year, 2014, there were about 10 million repositories there. Currently, there is about uh, 20 million repositories. So these repositories contain huge amount of really valuable code, really valuable programs, and I believe it's very, very important to somehow be able to reuse this information. Huge amount of effort has gone into developing these programs, uh, debugging the programs, uh, maintaining them, fixing bugs there, running them, and so on and so forth. And you'd like to somehow reuse this effort when you are building uh, new programs or trying to solve some challenges, new programming challenges, and not start from scratch again all over from the beginning. Okay? So, um, <coughs> in the last three, four years, we have been trying to kind of address this question of how can we actually l uh, leverage this big code, this big amount of programming data in order to build uh, and solve tools and solve problems that you cannot do with uh, traditional techniques, rule-based techniques. So we have developed a bunch of techniques uh, and a bunch of uh, tools, new kinds of probabilistic tools based on probabilistic models that can uh, <coughs> solve uh, problems and challenges that are very hard to solve uh, traditionally or practically impossible to solve. Okay? So what I'd like to do in the next uh, a few slides is kind of give you an intuition for uh, the kinds of problems that we can solve and draw an analogy to other areas of computer science, which also use this kind of big data and probabilistic models to solve uh, interesting problems. So here is an example of uh, an image uh, from the, so this is an example from the field of computer graphics. So this is an image and it's partially, uh, some part of the image is missing. So maybe the cat chewed the image or something happened to it, okay? So uh, researchers in computer graphics have figured out a way to take such images and to actually complete these images into these images on the right uh, by using probabilistic models or, or huge amounts of photographs that are available out there and figure out how to complete these kind of partial photographs or scenes into uh, uh, these scenes here that make more sense than the original one. Okay, so this is based on, on uh, statistical information, uh, statistical uh, models of, of uh, photographs. Okay, so now there is a corresponding problem uh, similar corresponding problem, anal analogous problem in the field of programming, where you have a program which you have written partially, and you may wonder what happens next, what you should do next, okay? So we have built a tool that can actually, a system that can actually um, take programs like this and actually figure out how to actually complete these programs, how to generate new code that didn't exist before. So uh, this kind of system called Slang appeared last year and it's based on uh, deep learning techniques of over uh, large code bases. So learns probabilistic models and then can actually complete and generate new code that did not exist before. So this completion here was not in the training data form. Okay? Here's another example from the field of natural language translation. Okay? Many people have used this uh, system, okay? Google Translate. So this says on the left that Martin is talking to TC now, I hope that's true. And uh, when I click translate, uh, it's going to produce something in Hebrew. Okay, on the right, I cannot pronounce it, unfortunately, here. But uh, so these kind of statistical systems, like the Google Translate, are based on probabilistic models of, of a parallel corpus of lots of translations. Okay, so they give you likely translations to an existing uh, sentence that you put in here. Okay, so there is a similar problem for programs again, a corresponding problem. So you put the program on the left in one programming language and you can actually translate this program into another program, into a different programming language or in a different environment. So we have built such a system uh, based on, again, statistical probabilistic models of, of, of this big code, this massive uh, code bases that are out there, which can translate between uh, programming languages and programs. And here's the last example that I'm gonna use. So this is uh, uh, an example from the field of computer vision where you have 
have a, an image on the left here, which is a noisy image, as you can see, as you can see on the back. And uh, you can use probabilistic techniques to actually denoisify the image, to clean up the image, and uh, to use this image instead of this one here. Okay. So once again, there is a corresponding problem in the field of programs, which is the problem of deobfuscation. Right? We have a program here on the left, this program here, which is very tricky to read and understand what it is doing, and uh, we have built a system uh, called JS Nice, which can take programs like this and actually produce programs like this on the right, which are much easier to understand what they're doing and uh, what, the, what the program is doing and how it's behaving. Okay, so this is based on work that appeared uh, this year at Popoff. So now if the internet worked, worked I can show you a demo. Uh, so this is uh, a JS Nice, the system that I mentioned. Okay, so let's see. Okay, it works. So on the left, I have a program here. Okay, so this is this runs as a web service. You can just go there and check it out yourself. And then you can click uh, Niceify. And uh, what it's going to do if the internet works? Um, but of course, uh, maybe it's not connected here. Again, let's see. Ah, it's working. Okay, yeah. So what it's doing is it's taking the program here on the left, and once you click Niceify. It actually uh, predicts new, new variable names for the variables here. So this variable here, E, actually became string. And it also predicts types for these variables here, for the parameters, OK? And so this program here on the right is much easier to understand than what the program, what it's doing than the program on the left, all right? So this system like JS Nice um, is actually very widely used, um, has become a uh, extremely popular since the time it was released. It's used by security researchers, by people in security, by people in programming, trying to understand code, trying to uh, deobfuscate code, and so on and so forth, okay? So since it's released, I think it was exactly a year ago, it's now used worldwide in uh, 191 countries. It's one of the top ranked tools for JavaScript, um, and uh, it, it has a, quite a large following, okay? So people who use that system, they're Initially, when this came out, they were wondering how, how this works even. How, how is this possible? So there were lots of positive comments, like uh, this is an amazing tool for diminifying JavaScript, or this is Goat, or I've been looking for this for years. And they were wondering how this thing works, actually. So there is a guy here on the bottom who said, tell me how this works. And uh, many people asked how this works. They weren't sure. OK, so in summary, I believe these programming tools based on big code, based on big programming data, can actually have tremendous impact on programmers, developers, security, and many areas of, of associated with software. So what I'd like to do in the remaining time is give you a little bit of an idea of how you actually go about building these tools, OK? And by the time we finish, you should have some idea roughly what the dimensions are. And also, I will tell you about a framework that you can use to build uh, tools like JS Nice and get going very quickly, all right? So when you go about building probabilistic programming tools based on big code, based on big data, there are many dimensions to consider, okay? Many technical dimensions to consider. First, of course, is the application that you're going to be uh, solving, the problem that you're going to be addressing. But then there is a bunch of other dimensions here that are uh, uh, very rich dimensions, and you have to decide how to actually instantiate them. So one thing you have to worry about is what is it that you are learning over, okay? You may not be learning over the syntax of the program. The programs are not just text. They are text, they, are, they transform data, they, are, they generate data. They are not just images or videos, okay? So you need to figure out what is the right representation of a program that you're going to be learning over from all this uh, amount of, of, of programs there, big code. You also have to worry how you're going to be extracting this representation. The fact that you know what it is does not mean you can actually extract it accurately from programs, okay? Then you have to worry about the kind of machine learning models that you use, how do you train them, how do you query them, how, uh, how do they interact, this whole thing. And this, all of these dimensions are actually connected, okay? So in the last few years, two, three years or so, we have instantiated these dimensions with many different choices, built many different kinds of applications, some of which I already showed you, uh, <coughs> playing with different intermediate representations, different machine learning models, uh, deep learning models, graphical models, statistical models, all kinds of things. Right? So what I'd like to do next 
is to give you a little bit of an idea about one of the recent uh, approaches that we, that we proposed uh, and a framework based on this approach, uh, which I believe is very suitable for building these uh, probabilistic programming tools of the future. So JS Nice is just uh, an application on top of this framework, on top of this model. All right. So what we're going to do next, we're going to look, state exactly what the problem is. So it's going to get a little bit more technical. So we're going to state what the problem is. Uh, why is it hard? What's the solution that, we, uh, that is uh, uh, illustrated here by this combination of, of techniques? And what are the results? Okay? And then I'll show you the framework. So let's get going. So I'm going to use JS Nice as an example here because uh, it is easy to illustrate the concepts. But they're very generally applicable. So here is a program over here. And in this program, uh, some of the variable names are uh, obfuscated. They're very short. They're minified. And uh, some of these variable names, uh, A and B here, OK, I'm going to uh, use red to denote that these are variable names whose values we would like to predict. So there will be some facts that are unknown, so these variable names whose names I'd like to predict. And there is going to be some facts that are known. So this may be the API that the program calls. This may be the name of the object, and so on and so forth. So this is the notation that we use. Red for things we want to predict, blue for things that we already know. Okay? And so the core problem is, okay, how do you predict uh, facts that are unknown given the known facts? Okay? So you can phrase many, many problems in that way. JS uh, Nice is just one example here. All right? So now, why is this problem difficult? Why is it difficult to predict many things about a program, be it the names, be, be it predicting new code, being predicting a description of code, like natural language, whatever? Why is this hard? So th here are the four challenges that you have to address somehow if you want to build these systems that really work on, uh, on, uh, on large scale. So the first one is, and this is probably the most tricky one, is that the predictions are usually dependent on one another. So they are not isolated predictions. So there is a dependence between the predictions, so between the names. This is like if you have an image and you want to predict something about pixels, all the predictions are usually dependent about the different pixels. And usually, when you talk about predicting things about programs, there is many, many choices. So for instance, if I want to predict names of variables, there may be millions of possible choices. Okay? You must be able to quickly learn from huge code bases so JS Nice, for instance, learns uh, entire model over GitHub in about two hours. So how does this happen? Uh, and the prediction should be fast, should be basically instantaneous if you want it to be useful. All right? So what is the key technical idea for how you go about solving these prediction problems? All right? So the key technical idea, Okay, if you don't remember anything of the technical bits, this is the technical bit that somehow has to stay, is this idea of phrasing the prediction of unknown things as structured prediction for program, a structured output prediction. And what does that mean? Okay. So what it means is that uh, you are going to be phrasing the problem in a way where you are learning a particular kind of probabilistic model called a conditional random field. You're going to be learning this model in a particular way, and you're going to be querying this model also in a particular way. And all of this is going to be helped by program analysis techniques. So you merge these machine learning techniques with, uh, with uh, programming languages techniques like program analysis. Now, why is this important, um, this uh, connection of uh, this, this, this concept of doing structure prediction for programs? So structure prediction is a technique which has been very, very widely used in things like computer, in fields like computer vision. Okay? So by being able to connect programs with conditional random fields, with structured prediction, you can actually enable huge amount of research that has happened in the field of uh, machine learning in conditional random fields and in those kinds of complex predictions to the domain of programs. So this paper here, which introduced this concept, how to do structure prediction for programs, beyond the applications like JS Nice and other applications, has actually very conceptual value. If you want to do very rich predictions, okay, you need to be able to know how to connect programs with these powerful probabilistic models. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over each of these boxes, each of these pieces here of the puzzle, and give you a little bit of a technical idea what they are. Okay? 
and then how can you build your own uh, prediction, uh, prediction system. So let me start with the machine learning model that is suitable for the task of predicting things about programs. All right? So the machine learning model that we use in this entire structure prediction approach for program is called the conditional random field. Conditional random fields are uh, an undirected probabilistic graphical model uh, and uh, they uh, capture dependencies between facts to be predicted. So here again, we're going to be using red for facts to be predicted and blue for facts on which we're going to condition things that we already know. All right. So this conditional random fields is a powerful graphical model that was introduced fairly recently uh, in the early 2000s by John Lafferty, Andrew McCallum, and uh, Fernando Pereira. And it really has tremendous impact in various areas like NLP and computer vision and so on, but has never so far been connected to programs. All right. So one thing to notice here in this definition, so let's not worry too much about the mathematical definition, just worry that this probabilistic model is parameterized on some weights and some feature functions here, okay? So if I want to build a conditional random field, I have to figure out what those weights and feature functions are. Now one note here is that uh, we are using undirected models over directed models like Bayesian networks. And the reason is, that is easier to model with undirected models because you then don't have to worry about the relationship, how to establish a direction of the influence on the things you're trying to predict. So let me give you an example of how would you build a conditional random field, just conceptually how you go about this. So let's suppose that there are two variables, i and r, whose names I would like to predict, and there is a variable t on which I'm going to be conditioning on. So one thing that I may know is that just intuitively, I may say that there is a dependence between the predictions of I and R ex expressed here via this edge, and there is a dependence on the prediction of I given the value of T, okay? So I capture this via uh, this graph, this network here, but the, uh, to build a conditional random field, what you need to do is to actually instantiate this, to parameterize this network, to instantiate it with the appropriate weights and feature functions, and thereby obtaining a CRF, okay? So here is one possible instantiation here, which is going to lead me to building a CRF. So I can define a bunch of functions here on the left and their corresponding weights. So the way to read this thing here is that I have a function F1, very simple function, which takes, the v if it takes the value a, a run for i, and it takes the value of Israel for t, then it's going to return one. Otherwise, it's going to return zero. So it's a very simple indicator function, what I'm showing here. And on the right is the weight that is associated with this indicator function. So I have just parameterized this network by these feature functions and by this weight, by these weights, okay? And uh, this uniquely determines a conditional random field by just plugging in the functions and the weights into the formula and it determines a conditional probability distribution like this. So what we are going to be doing is learning these very powerful conditional random fields over data, over big code. All right, so the two takeaway points here are undirected graphical models over directed graphical models, that's one of the choices, and conditional random fields over uh, Markov random fields over joint probability distribution. So here we are doing, we are conditioning on X. We are not computing the joint probability distribution of PY comma X. The reason why this is so is because when you're working with conditional distributions, you don't have to give priors on X, which usually you don't care to do when you're making these kinds of predictions. So these are two choices to remember here. Once you have defined the model that you're going to use, the CRF, which is a fairly broad model, one thing you have to learn, you have to worry about, is how do you actually obtain the model from data? Here is the big code, how do I learn these things from data? So the problem statement is, given uh, a data set like this, so I have a bunch of samples here, okay, of known things, of, of known things and their predictions, okay, so I have many, many samples. I'd like to actually learn a conditional random fields over this data set. So one big probabilistic model, all right? When you're learning models from data, no matter what, be it big code, be it, be it images, it doesn't matter what, you have to define, you have to decide on the optimization objective that you're optimizing the model for. And that optimization objective depends on how you're going to be using this model later. So there's many different optimization objectives, each with different trade-offs. 
<coughs> so the optimization objective that makes sense when you're predicting things about programs is something called a max margin objective, okay? And uh, <coughs> this is essentially a training which is a little uh, richer than support vector machine training called structured SVM training. And let's not worry about the equation here. Let me just explain it to you intuitively. What it says is I'm going to go over every sample in my training data. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to learn such a model, such a CRF model, such that for any prediction, for uh, every prediction that the model makes, which is in the training data, this prediction has to be better than any other prediction, any other prediction than the one in the training data by some margin. Thereby, I get confidence in the weights that I learned during training. Okay, so this is one optimization objective. Here's the important bit about this optimization objective and why this training makes sense uh, in this setting. One of the reasons why it makes sense is because you eliminate the computation of this function over here called the partition function, which is extremely expensive. It's at least exponential. Okay? So this choice of the particular training here is very, very important for achieving scalability, the structured SVM training. There are many details around the training, like the regularization, the convergence rates, what kind of gradient descent you're doing. There are many details that we're not going to go over it. Uh, you can uh, find, those in, uh, find those in the paper. All right. Finally, uh, finally, once you have learned a model, and you have trained that model, the CRF, you have to decide how you're going to be querying the model. <coughs> and I have presented it one by one, the model, the learning, the querying. But the learning of the model and the way that you're going to be querying it are tightly connected. So the type of queries that you make on the model also det determine the kind of learning that you're going to be doing. So what queries make sense to be making on these probability distributions over programs that you are learning? So the query, the type of query that makes sense is something called map inference. This is maximum or posteriori inference. And all that it's saying is, is that given the known facts over here x, we would like to predict uh, the unknown facts which maximize the probability distribution. So this is a very intuitive query. Okay? So you need to make a joint prediction over all of the possible unknown facts. All right? So if you expand this a little bit, you're going to end up with the following equation you're going to end up with the equation that uh, this, the best prediction is the, is the one which maximizes the probability distribution given a known fact, okay? And one thing that you will notice here, once you fix x, this function over here on the bottom becomes constant, so you can get rid of the function. So you essentially end up with the following, uh, the following query. So it's just the product of weights and feature functions over the unknown things and the known things, all right? So this is your map inference query that you're going to be making over the probabilistic model. All right? There is various map inference algorithms like max product belief propagation, Gibbs sampling, and so on and so forth. You can adapt those to do map inference. Uh, unfortunately, uh, for our setting of programs where there is a huge amount of predictions to be made, um, there's just huge amount of labels. Traditional algorithms don't work that well, so we had to design our own map inference uh, algorithm, map inference variant. All right? Now, map inference, as explained here, you know, kind of makes sense. I want to make the, joint, the best joint prediction over all of the unknown variables. But there is another possible query that people have played with in various papers, in various works, something called the max marginals. So instead of querying for the best y given x, what they do is they query individually for each element that you'd, I would like to predict. So first I would say, give me the best y1 here, okay? Given x, give me the best y2, give me the best y3, give me the best yn. So predict it individually. So each of the marginals, okay? So this is a query which is known as, uh, as max marginals, and then I'm just going to combine these results. So this one is not suited for programs, okay? And there are two reasons why. First, this is not guaranteed to give you the best joint assignment. More importantly, it is very difficult to enforce constraints between the predictions that you are making. There's various constraints you may want to enforce, programming language constraints, which may be actually very hard to enforce using uh, max marginals. And that is why map inference is the right query for this setting. So let me give you an example with JSNICE. 
to give you an idea for how this map inference works uh, on a simple example. So this is actually the program that's on the website that you can try. Uh, so once again, in red we have the variables whose names we would like to predict. And in blue we have the known facts. So this could be APIs, this could be some fields of objects, and so on and so forth. So in the first step, so this is what happens when you go on the website and click Nicify. These exact steps happen. So the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to be uh, using program analysis techniques, static program analysis techniques, to actually extract these unknown things from the program over here, as well as all of the known things, and then you're going to be building your graphical model. You're going to build a dependence network which captures how you think these things depend on one another. So this is the first step over here. So here I have extracted a bunch of local variables, I have extracted a bunch of APIs and field names, and here I have built a network which captures the dependence between them, that I think captures the dependence between them. As a second step, what you're going to do, you're going to take your network over here, this dependence graph that you have built, and you're going to consult your probabilistic model to find out how to parameterize it. So what are the feature, feature functions and what are the weights? So what this thing here says is, I have six feature functions. Each line is a feature function with its corresponding weight. So what this one is saying is I have a feature function where i, if i is equal to i, and if t is equal to step, then the indi indicator function will return one. Otherwise, it will return zero, and this function has a particular weight. So each of the edges are parameterized on these feature functions, and then what I can do is I can actually perform my map inference. I can try to uh, uh, ask this query over here, okay? So this is the map inference query that I had already explained earlier. So if you ask this query over here, what is the best assignment uh, to this red unknown facts over here, given your feature functions and the weights, the map inference is going to return the following assignment. It's going to say, well, I think that i should be i, I think that t should be step, I think that i should be i here, r should be length, and r should be length, and length stays the same. So it's going to find the best possible assignment of the unknown, unknown uh, elements. One question here is, where do these names come from? Okay, where are these labels come from? They come from the training data. You can get them directly from the, uh, from the data that are available there. Okay, so you have your program, you build your network, you do your map inference, and you get your assignments to these unknown facts, and once you do that, you obtain your solution. So that's how you obtain the resulting program over here, replacing these unknown facts with your new predictions as a result of the map inference, all right? Good, so I hope that this gives you a little bit of an idea for how you go about building these probabilistic programming tools. So you have to pick the right probabilistic model, in this case conditional random fields, not joint, not joint, not Markov random fields or Markov network, but something that is conditioning. You have to pick the right learning methodology, structured SVM training as opposed to other kinds of trainings. You have to pick the right query for the task map inference over max marginals, and you have to glue all these things by extracting the necessary elements from the program using program analysis techniques, okay? So this approach here that I just presented to you um, has been implemented in this framework over here called nice to predict okay? So everything that I showed you here so far, you can try it online, and it is fully open source on GitHub, and so you can use it to build your own prediction engines. As I mentioned already, JS Nice is just built on top of Nice to predict. So here I have my program over here, the input program, and I can try it right now. I can say extract the features using program analysis. So this is exactly what it's going to do here, extracts a bunch of features. Then I'm going to say, show me the prediction graph. So it's going to show it over here. Okay, so I have a prediction graph. All right. And I can do, I can, it's a bit mangled here, but let me just drag it around. You can actually drag it around. So there is some things that are known, and there is some things that you have to, you have to uh, predict, okay? So I can drag it around like this, boom. All right. Here, once I have the graph, I can do map inference. So it's going to predict things for these unknown entities, and then I'm going to generate the output there by updating the new program, okay? So this whole thing is uh, available on GitHub. You can just download it and build your own system. All right, right now. So um, people have already started building their own systems on top of this. You don't have to re-implement CRFs, max margin training, and all these things which are implemented very efficiently in this framework, and they're very, very fast. 
Um, good. So let me show you how this system looks when you actually build it and what are some of the results when you actually uh, run this system, system like JS Nice. So this is how it looks operationally. So over here we have the learning phase on the bottom and we have the GitHub data, the big code is sitting over here. And what you're going to do is you're first going to take each program in this big code and you're going to analyze it with static program analysis, thereby extracting a bunch of these networks, a bunch of these unknown facts and known facts connected. So there will be millions of those extracted over here. Then you're going to be learning your probabilistic model, the conditional random field using the particular learning techniques that I showed you, okay? Once you have learned the probabilistic model, this is done once and for all, then you can just query it infinitely many times. Okay, so I can take a new program, I can again perform program analysis, get the unknown facts, uh, code them up inference, con uh, contact the probabilistic model, and then obtain my, my result here. So how well does it work? And what happens here more concretely? So for program analysis, static program analysis, you use techniques like alias analysis, like scope analysis, static co-analysis, co-graph analysis, and things like this. On JS Nice, if you actually run it over the entire GitHub, you extract about 7 million feature functions uh, if you want to predict names, and about 70,000 if you want to predict types uh, of variables. You perform your max margin training here. This usually takes about two hours on the entire GitHub. Uh, and the resulting probabilistic models consisting of feature functions and their weights is about 150 megabytes, all right? On the client side, uh, what we have experimented with is a bunch of programs beyond, of course, the hundreds of thousands of programs that people have put in the system. These are our own programs. So typically, they are, uh, a program typically generates on the range of 30 nodes and 400 edges or so. Okay, this is, this is kind of the size of, a, of, of the network. The time is extremely fast for doing the map inference using the approximate algorithm. And uh, the accuracy is about 63% for names and 81% for types when you're doing this kind of predictions. Now when I say 63%, in fact some of the names that the system predicts are better than what are the original names. So uh, <laughs> that happens sometimes. Um, another interesting point here is <coughs> you can take programs and they actually do not type check very well. By removing the types and then giving it to JS Nice, it's going to predict your types and actually makes uh, more programs type check than the original, uh, the original annotations in the program. So that, that's also something useful. Um, okay? So I hope that this gives you a bit of an idea for the kind of scale that we work with, the kind of probabilistic models that we use, uh, the kind of analysis that we use, and how these things combine in building uh, uh, frameworks and, and probabilistic programming tools. So if you want to find out more, you can go to Nice to Predict, get the framework, and start start building your own tools, or go to the website and find more about the about the publications and, and the techniques there. Now, in the next few minutes, two three minutes, I want to tell you a bit where I'd like to see some of this research go. In what what direction do I want to see it go, and the kind of results that I'd like to see in the next five to ten years or so. Okay. So here. Uh, in this whole area of machine learning for programming or machine learning for code analytics, we're still roughly around here, okay? So we have some really cool applications. They have a lot of impact. They're very interesting applications, predicting code, translating between languages, the obfuscating code. Um, there's a really cool system that's built here, the Technion Code Prime by Aran's group, which is doing code search. So we're still at the application stage, okay? No matter how sophisticated this is. Now what we would like to do is slowly as time goes on to move towards frameworks. So nice to predict is one framework, but I hope that there is going to be more frameworks on top of which you can build your own system quickly. So now I can build JS Nice on top of nice to predict literally in hours instead of taking me months as before. Then as time goes on, we have, we have many applications, so it's going to be the age of applications. I think this is going to continue for another few years, maybe three, four years more, uh, some frameworks. And we slowly would like to move towards theory, towards methods, techniques for building these tools. What do I mean by this? So in fields like computer vision, for instance, there is various probabilistic models, um, Markov networks, which have very specific properties, like the POTS model, the ISYNC model, models from statistical physics, which have very specific mathematical properties which make learning and inference more tractable. And they're very well suited for predictions about images. In the case of programs, which are very complicated entities, very complicated semantic entities, we still don't have 
uh, a complete theoretical characterizations of the probabilistic models and what their trade-offs are. So we'd like to figure out um, fundamental models that are suited for programs with specific theoretical properties here. And once we do that, I think this will enable another range, another set of applications at a different level of understanding than where we are currently. Okay? In fact, these things are structured as belts in, in martial arts. See, we are still with the orange belt. I want to get to the black belt over time. Okay? So hopefully we kind of can move over and we don't get stuck just here. No matter how cool, we don't we are not just over here. Okay? We actually can produce some common frameworks, common theoretical foundations and applications based on this. So uh, in summary, I hope I have convinced you that this is an interesting uh, direction. The, it's an emerging trend. Uh, a lot of this big code, um, there's a huge amount of uh, programs available out there, not just in public repositories, also in private repositories, various companies. There is a tremendous impact to be had uh, by these probabilistic programming tools. JS Nice is one example. Uh, hopefully there will be more examples in the future. It's a rich problem space for research if you want to do research in this, okay? So there are many dimensions to the problem that are virtually unexplored still. And uh, there are many interesting challenges going forward, both applications, frameworks, theoretical models, and, and applications, again, based on this uh, theory. So that's it. Thank you.